Hey, Blazer Tales. Oh, if I got such a good one for you today. Uh, this is going to be a first chapter Friday reading of The Call of the Rands by Jeannie L. Wash. Oh my gosh, this is such a good book. Now, this is more considered an adult book, which I usually don't do. But Jenny Walsh wrote um, Over and Out, which was a middle school book, which I absolutely adored. So um, it was an amazing book. So when I was asked to do this, and I was like, of course I will, not realizing it was an adult book. But then once I started, I could not put it down. This book is amazing. I'm going to read the first chapter, which is a little bit long, but that's fantastic. Because when you meet the two characters in the first chapter, um, or actually three characters, but the first two characters I absolutely love. Um and it is here in Alabama today. It is cold. It is rainy. It is a good day to snuggle up on the couch and with a blanket and read a book. So I'm not going to snuggle up on the couch, but I am going to read you the first chapter. Let me share my screen real quick so that you can see um, that you can see my um, picture of the book. So you're not just looking at me. You're looking at the cover of the book. So there you go. That's The Call of the Rins by Jeannie L. Walsh. And that is Jeannie right there. I don't know why her picture's a little blurry, but um, anyway. So chapter one is, and every chapter is, you, it flip-flops between Marion and Evelyn. Those are our main two characters. And um, the first one, chapter one is Marion. It takes place July 1940 in West Devon. The knock came at dusk. Marion knew the rhythm of it instantly. Slow, quick, click, slow, quick, quick. The pattern had been conceived over 20 years ago after a long night of revelry at the dance hall. Eddie, Sarah, and Marion had fox-trotted for hours. Cheeks flushed. Sarah had hung her current on her current beau's arms and instructed Eddie to wrap the melody on the boys' cabin before retiring for the evening. The knock had become a bit of an inside joke, used liberally even on random doors. Now it had to be Sarah calling on Marion. It wouldn't be Eddie. Marion didn't rise from her chair, the darkness of the room all around her. Marion, I know you're in there. She heard Sarah's pixie voice, a voice that was once as familiar to Marion as the sisters. The bustle of the chickens outside filled the silence that followed. Sarah tried again. The windows open. You'd close it up tight if you were working at the library. There was another beat of foul-filled din until the doorknob jiggled. Marion always kept it locked. Not that anyone ever at all came, let me start that, not that anyone ever came all the way out to her small cottage, which was the way she liked it. You leave me no choice, Sarah called. I'll come in through the window if I must. Marion rolled her head from one side to the other, stiff from sitting since her afternoon tea. There was no stopping Sarah, that bull-headed woman, she did this every few years, fluttering into Marion's life and checking in on her, reminding Marion of her bond that they had, reminding her of Sarah's betrayal, ultimately stirring up painful memories. Even now, hearing the knock melody, hearing Sarah's voice, knowing they shared an unspoken guilt, one Marion couldn't forgive Sarah or herself for, made Marion press a hand to her abdomen as if she needed to physically hold herself together. Marion's fingertips touched the softened paper she habitually kept within her dress pocket, a reminder of self-inflicted comeuppance from what she once had to do. A tightness stretched across Marion's chest. Those moments, those feelings, that angst should have been left in Marion's past. Why wouldn't Sarah allow it? Why did Sarah insist on inserting reminders into Marion's present? More so, why must Sarah insert herself literally into Marion's home? She heard a stack of books topple by the window, the window Sarah undoubtedly just climbed through. Marion had kept a stack there. She kept one beside her chair. She kept stacks nearly everywhere with her, within her four walls. The unfortunate sounds of Sarah's uneven footsteps maneuvered through Marion's cottage until there she was. A woman who'd once been a fixture in Marion's life, a heavy-handed fixture at that. Sarah had aged since she had last visited Miriam, but she still held the same lithe figure and heart-shaped face. The scar next to her eye, given to her by Miriam, could easily blend with her laugh lines, if Sarah had a mind for laughing, which at the moment it appeared she did not. Miriam didn't use any words to greet her. 
She didn't stand. She remained in her chair in front of the unlit hearth, a perfectly positioned beam of light hitting the novel in her lap. That evening, she'd chosen lolly willows, with which Marion felt a peculiar, peculiar kinship, both middle-aged spinsters, both having suffered great losses that uh, upended their lives. In the novel, the character of Laura made a pact with the devil for her freedom. Though she was never truly free, Miriam wondered, she released a long sigh as Sarah saw an opening to the heavy curtains. There, Sarah said, dusting her hands together, adequate light. Within a large cage atop a pedestal, a pigeon cooed as if saying hello to an old friend. Traitor. I hadn't expected to see your bird again, Sarah said, taking on a softer tone, making her way deeper into the room. My father's pigeons rarely lived past 15, but 486 is a special bird, isn't he? Sarah stopped beside Marion, her arms raising as if she meant to stroke Marion's hair. Instead, Sarah clasped her hands together as, um, at her middle. I'm fine, Marion said abruptly. Her voice croaked the first time she had used it in days. Over the years, she had become learned on her condition. Being in the midst of an uneasy social, social situation that all but froze her tongue, Otherwise, talking or not talking was one at her own discretion. She generally spoke as a means to an end. To Sarah, she said, I'm eating. I walk daily. I work in the library on my appointed days. Even 486 is doing fine, as you can see. Good on you for checking on the hermit. Go home to your family, Wren Brown. Marion had purposely spoken in a bitter tone and intentionally used Sarah's formal title. Sarah glanced at 486 again and ignored Marion's attempt to put distance between them. I am, in fact, coming to you as Wren Brown. Despite herself, Marion upturned her chin to better see Sarah. These days, it took a lot to pique Marion's interest, unless it was written on the pages of a book where a happy ending was nearly always promised. She'd once thought her own was as good as guaranteed. Marion had once put so much stock in serving as, as a wren, being a part of the woman's, the women's Royal Naval Service had driven her to a fault. But that was a long time ago. The war had ended. The wrens disbanded. So why was Sarah coming to her as Wren Brown now? If she knew Sarah, Mar Marion had only had to wait for a woman, for the woman to continue. As she did, as um, as she did, asking Marion, have you kept up with the happenings? There's another war on. There's another war on. Hadn't Marion heard that many times before? Hadn't that been the end, the beginning of the end? Sarah stared at Marion another few beats, neither blinking before Sarah looked away and studied the small room, her gaze zeroing in on a stack of books besides Marion. She'd sit there, Marion knew. Nowhere else for her, nowhere else for her to do so. As predicted, Sarah perched on the stack, leaned closer. My children are safe with my parents, but I've joined up again as a Jenny. The wrens are back on. I think you should return with me. Sarah was slow to say more. Did she suspect Marion was reliving her betrayal? Or was Sarah hesitant for another reason, as if there was something that she was leaving unsaid that went beyond their secrets? Again, Marion's hand ticked toward, the, tick, ticked toward the yellow document in her dress pocket. She was half a mind to ask Sarah what she was after. The other half simply wanted to be left alone. Please go, Sarah. Marion wanted nothing more to do with a second war. But Sarah didn't take leave. I'll retire here for the night. It's too late to travel. But Sarah didn't take her leave. I'm sorry, I just read that one. Sarah pulled free the throw blanket strewn across the back of the very chair in which Marion sat and proceeded to an armchair in the corner by the bird. By the third thud from the removal of books from the cushions, Marion was on her feet. She retreated to her bunk, knowing her memories would travel through time, back a time until she was back in Birmingham, back to where it began. To Marion, desire the desire to be wanted, the beginning of her downfall. We're going back in time to March 1914 in Birmingham. 
Did you hear me, Marion? Sister Margaret stood in front of Marion's chair. I said, if it's any consolation, has anyone told you that your name means wished for child? Wished for child. Hearing those words almost brought a young Marion's head up from Jane Eyre, but she kept on reading without acknowledging Sister Margaret's sentiment. This is a quote from Jane Eyre. Children can feel, but they cannot analyze their feelings. And if the anal analysis is partially affected in thought, they know not how to express the result of the process in words. That last part, Marion read Jane's thoughts again. They know not how to express the result of their process in words. Marion had never spoken to another human not that she could remember, in her 14 years and in her many different homes. The memory of one of the earliest so-called homes was jumbled almost as if Miriam were seeing herself instead of possessing her own body. She'd been a babbling three-year-old, her papers stated, but when Marion had been surrounded by so many new faces, too many faces, whipping in front of her, shouting, screaming. She had been unable to form any words as if her facial muscles had turned to stone on their own accord. At her feet, a wetness puddled on the ground. She turned and ran. Where? Marion didn't remember, but it, that had, um, but it had been in the dark that she hid. Her socks had been wet. Later, when she was found by a pleasant enough nun, Marion had chosen to continue not to speak. She'd chosen not to talk every single day since. Her mutism, as she had heard the doctors call it, was involuntary in situations where Marion held back a lack of control or a thrust into the center of attention. Otherwise, in moments where she didn't ex uh, experience paralyzing fear, Marion simply had no desire to gift that part of herself to another human being, who'd soon be nothing more than another memory. Another nun, another priest, another home mother, another foundling. A carousel of faces coming and going, gone too quickly. Ironic, what Marion read next, for one thing, I have no father or mother, brothers or sisters. Sister Margaret's words that Marion had wished that was she was a wished for child might mean something if she hadn't just told Marion that she was being relocated to yet another orphanage in the morning, Sister Margaret, with her expressionless face, didn't look like she'd cry a second over Marion leaving. It'd be one less mouth to feed, one less child to clothe, to house, to educate. Wished for child, Marion thought not. But Sister Margaret had fed her, clothed her, housed her, educated her. So for those reasons, Marion raised her head and smiled at this small act of kindness before she went and packed up her few belongings. She's a mute, Mary heard whisper as she shook her first, she took her first steps into St. Anne's home for boys and girls. Sister Margaret had just handed Marion off to St. Sister Florence, who now edged her deeper into the entrance hall. Usually there was a little excitement about the arrival of someone of Marion's age, not like there, there was with the younger kids. It made it easier it made Marion feel less like stone when only a few children turned up with a quick hello. But now Marion's cheeks flushed and her brow hardened from the many eyes upon her. As if she were, as if she were new, uh, new, the newest act coming to the Smith Hearth, I'm sorry, the small hearth with the stain, uh, Sanger Circus. She'd never actually been to the circus, but Marion had seen a troop's arrival in, to London one time. There had been a parade to announce themselves with a menagerie of military band, an elephant, over 50 horses, and a collection of living, living human curiosities. For the group of kids standing before Marion, peering between and over each other, Marion was one of those curiosities, the wordless waif. See the girl who has never spoken a word, not one, never a grunt, nor a groan, nor a laugh, try as you may. At each home she lived in, the other children had tried, making it a game to cajole something out of Marion, generally a cuss. But soon they'd seen Marion was not going to give in to their antics. They'd get tired of her. Moreover, Marion didn't 
Um, let me start over. Moreover, Marion didn't intend to play with them at all, shaking her head as Mar at marbles and kicked the wick. Marion would read. She was a reader. Her friends were always present, Jane Eyre and Elliot, the Dashwood sisters. She made the mistake of getting close to another girl once before, silently playing dolls and cards. The girl had even enticed Marion to play tag. Marion let herself giggle softly at the girl's jokes at a first for her. One morning on the loo, Marion even whispered her name, Caroline, for only her ears to hear. Caroline, Caroline. But then Caroline had been adopted a few days later. Marion hadn't picked up a book the entire time that they played together. But after Caroline left, Jane Eyre was still there waiting for Marion. In St. Anne's foyer, Marion stood ramrod straight, a small chalkboard hung around her neck. As the other children looked on, she hugged her small satchel to her chest to hide the slate, but also in a protective manner. She held Jane Eyre inside her bag. Marion had pilfered the book uh, three orphanages ago. Beyond her book, the bag's contents consisted of only two more articles, the gingham cloth Marion had been found in, which she guessed to be a position of a woman's dress, I'm sorry, a portion of the woman's dress, and a cheap brooch that had been attached to the blue and white fabric. Marion was certain that if the jewelry had been worth, worth, it would never have landed in her hands. As far as the scrap of cloth, lonely days and nights had left Marion to imagine the young mother who'd torn the skirt of her dress to wrap and discard the unwanted newborn. Perhaps the efforts to keep Marion warm had meant a portion of her mother had once cared for her, or perhaps the scrap of fabric was a hastily executed afterthought, motivated by guilt from the fact that it had been a cold December day. In either case, she was abandoned. One of the older girls, probably similar to Marion's age, approached her in the entrance hall of St. Anne's and said hello. Even if Marion wanted to, which she didn't, she felt she felt herself unable to respond to the girl. Not with all of those eyes on her, especially not with how the girl widened her eyes in a mocking manner. The others found this funny. Sister Florence tisked. Marion locked her glaze on the tiled floor. With relief, she watched the girl's shoes backpedal into the semicircle that she had come from. Sister Florence raised her head again, including her, I'm sorry, let me start. Marion stepped forward, slightly raising her head again, including the, knee, the knees of the other children in the line of sight. A boy with a hole in his trousers stood in front of her next. He extended his hand. I'm Edward. He waited, his hand still outstretched. There was a time when the idea of engaging with a peer and returning the gesture would have seemed hopeless, too overwhelming. But Marion had been in this position many times before, so she focused on only his face and, ignoring the others, took a deep breath and slowly shook his hand. The others snickered, their presence flooding her again. Marion caught the roll of Edward's eyes before he turned to show his disapproval to the others. They fell silent, with the exception of one girl who, tithered behind her head, who uh, tittered behind her hand. To Marion, he continued as if nothing else had happened. But everyone calls me Eddie. Marion had no plans to call him anything, let alone Eddie. Beneath a mop of red hair, he was all arms, teeth, and freckles. And at that, Sister Florence clapped her hands once, a folder with Marion's name on it tucked beneath her arm. Now that we've all welcomed Marion off to breakfast, it's on the table. Marion was quickly forgotten, thank the Lord, that she and the other muscles in her face softened and became her own again. Sister Florence reached for Marion's bag. I'll just put these upstairs in the girls' wings. Fifth bed on the right, next to little Millie. Marion hesitantly let go of her me meager belongings. More slowly than the others, she walked into the dining hall. It wasn't unlike the other homes. Six or so long tables, 20 or so children at each table. There was a short line of children waiting for a free spot to sit. Edward was in line, joking and jostling with the others there. He saw Marion approach and offered her a toothy smile. His friendliness made her uncomfortable. She didn't smile back, yet, she, yet he seemed non-pulsed by her cold reaction. It was clear to the others were drawn to him. 
In line waiting to eat, Edward was holding court. Magnetic was the word for him. But as Marion dragged her feet toward the, the queue, she yearned to maintain her distance as if they were both too south or too north. She kept her focus on her shoes, embarrassed course through her. She wished her footwear were more remarkable, less holes, tighter stitching. His weren't much better, but still, it seemed to be better looked after. Soon, a seat was vacated for Edward, and he sat to eat. Marion shuffled forward in the queue, her hands balled in her sides, until one of the sisters motioned her to a newly vacated spot. Of course, it was beside Edward. Now, Marion's porridge was the most interesting thing she'd ever laid eyes on. Fortunately, Edward was caught up in the happenings around him. Watching one boy use his spoon to launch his breakfast into another boy's face, and Marion's presence, presence was generally unnoticed. Splendid. After breakfast, Marion found herself in the common room, where bookshelves lined one of the corners. There were more books than most places she had lived in. She was pleased about that. Marion planted herself in the corner, right on the floor, her feet crossed at the ankles, her dress neatly draped over her legs. Other children milled about. Marion's felt their glances and some of their stares, but they otherwise paid the wordless way little mind. At random, she plucked a book from the shelf. It was a game that Marion liked to play. Emma. She flipped to the beginning. Emma Woodhouse, handsome, clever, and rich, with a comfortable home and happy disposition, seemed to unite some of the blessed some of the best blessings of existence and had lived nearly 21 years in the world with very little to distress or vex her. Marion cocked her head thinking, hello, Emma. Well, aren't we strangers? I'm not certain I like you yet. I may, it may be some time before we become good friends. She used Paul's just within her line of sight, but then they were gone. Marion flipped her gaze up to watch Edward walk toward the drop, the drop table the draught's table, then returned to her book. Marion read again the next day, too. Edward paused in front of her again, this time a little longer. As she resumed reading his laugh, let me start over. Yeah, as she resumed reading his laugh while he kept company with the other boys, filtered into the corners. He glanced her way. Could his interest in her, could his interest be in her? Or was it one of the many books she was blocking? Marion was lolling in front of the bookcase, occasionally watching the children from behind the safety of her book. In all of her orphanages, she had come to recognize something. The girls generally paired off and formed tiny clusters, sometimes merging to create larger groups to engage in this or that. The boys likewise seemed to have their favorite chap, but they usually tumbled around together like a pack of wolves. Marion hadn't yet noticed with whom Edward was most chummy. It'd be odd if he didn't have a best mate. She thought of him again as magnetic, everyone and everything pulling toward him. Marion herself always felt more of a repellent after the novelty of being the li living human curiosity quickly wore off, which it already had, it seemed, with the other children. But perhaps not yet with Edward. With so little attention paid to her, it's, it had been easy to settle into her corner and escape into a book. Most of the novels advanced for Marion's age. She'd been educated in the three R's of writing, reading, and arithmetic, more than, more, the, more than other orphans in this place on account of her mutism. Way back when, when it first became apparent she wouldn't speak, a nun had held a bamboo, bamboo cane and a writing utensil mere inches from Marion's nose. You will communicate, she had been, she had told. Only one of these needs to be used. Marion had chosen the writing utensil. She learned to write, she learned to read, and she learned that if she didn't want the cane, she would use the small chalkboard she had been given. Now Marion saw the special consideration that had been given to eat to her in education as a grace. Where would she have been without her books? On the third day, Edward Shoes stopped in front of Marion. This time, Edward knelt. He leaned in conspiratorial whispering, um, have you been getting on all right? 
She debated not looking up, but Marion placed her finger on her spot in Emma and met his eyes. They were green, and her mind instantly conjured the Loch Ness Monster. Hmm, was Nessie even green? Or was that just how Marion had imagined the creature? She turned toward the shelf to her right, wondering if there was any literature on Nessie. Then Marion realized and turned herself back to Edward. He was eyeing the slate around her neck. Did he expect Marion to answer his question? His green eyes seemed to smile. What are you, around 13, 14? She nodded. Well, which is it, 13? Marion nodded her head. 14 then, older than me by a year. He snapped his fingers playfully. Well, I think I'm 13. No one is for sure. At my first orphanage, they lined me up against the wall with the other boys to try to see how old I was. Two, they decided back then, he shrugged. They must have written it all down in my papers because a later home, they told me the story as if it was funny, a way to figure me out. I'm not sure if it's funny, though. Marion shook her head. It wasn't comical. It was sad not knowing where you came from or how old you truly were. She knew all too well. Her own age had also been hypothesized. As her story went, she'd been left on the hospital doorsteps and little more than her nappy and what at one minute after midnight on the 1st of January at the turn of the century. Had it been a fresh start for the woman who'd birthed her? Had she been trying to erase everything prior to 1900, including Marion's existence? Marion would never know. But since she was still jaundiced, Marion was assumed to be days old, and she had been given the birth date of her abandonment. She supposed she and Edward were fortunate to know at least some of their story, though. Many didn't have papers that followed them from home to home. Edward gave a departing pat on his knees, then stood, brushing wavy hair from his eyes. Marion, he began. It was startling to hear her name coming from another child. Usually it was only the nuns who spoke to her. Can I come talk to you again? I told the others to leave you be, but would it be okay? I like talking to you. A peculiar thing to say, as she hasn't yet said anything to him in return. But Marion found herself nodding. This exchange had been harmless enough, but then she remembered Caroline and how she'd been... Um, how she had let herself come to enjoy the girl's company. Marion's head changed directions. Edward chuckled, then closed his eyes. Too late. I only saw the yes. He backed away, his lid still tight. A laugh slipped from Marion. Heard that too, he said. Marion's hands flew to her mouth. She held it there, covering a smile that surprised even her. Oh my gosh. Um, Marion and Edward or Eddie's story is absolutely amazing. Their love story is, oh, so, so good and so tear jerking. You have got to read. Let me go back to this real quick. Let me stop sharing. You have got to read The Call of the Rands by Jeannie L. Wash. Now, if you want to win this before you can buy it, because it comes out November the 15th, and I am currently doing this on October, October 30th. If you want to win the, the advanced reader copy of The Call of the Wrens before you can buy it, go to blazertales.com, sign up to win it. You will not regret it. This book is absolutely incredible. And the twist that's at the end of this book or kind of middle end, oh my gosh, this is so good. Okay, I will see you in the next video.